In our discussions so far, we've seen that the question, what should medical history be, has been answered in lots of different ways over the years. There is a diversity of views about the proper approach and the proper place of medical history. Some say its audience should be medical students, while others write for historians or the general public. Some say it should aim to humanize physicians or to make doctors more responsible, while others say it should aim to make all citizens more responsible. Some say that it should use the example of past physicians as a tool to inspire, whereas others think it should interact with religion, law, war, diplomacy, and society more broadly. There is, in other words, a multiplicity of coexisting approaches, styles, and aims within the field. The history of medicine will likely always be a heterogeneous field, one that reflects the diverse stances and agendas of its varied practitioners. Despite this, over time, there has been a gradual movement away from the great doctor's approach to things. Uh, as we've seen, by the mid-20th century, narratives documenting medical progress and celebrating its heroes were being challenged by newer stories, uh, stories that integrated medicine into larger accounts of economic, social, and political history. This idea of writing medicine into the general history of civilizations, if you want to call it that, uh, received a major boost from Henry Zigarist, who argued that uh, any study of medical history needs to begin with a consideration of economic and social structures. He also contended that historians needed to explore patients' lives, their social lives, that is, uh, their relationships with doctors, and the relationship between illness and social forces more broadly. Historians inspired by Zigarist were no longer simply providing medical students with blasts of inspiration by writing biographies of preceding generations of clinicians. Instead of trying to cultivate uh, what you might call future generations of gentlemen physicians, Sigurist offered a more sociological analysis of medicine. He was writing about things like how economic conditions shape health services, or about how political problems impact medical developments. Often this new kind of medical history was fused with uh, political activism. For his part, Sigurist called on doctors to lead struggles for the improvement of working conditions, and the universal extension of uh, medical care. And uh, the work of Susan Reverby and David Rosner accelerated these developments. Um, Reverby and Rosner came out of the civil rights, anti-war, women's, and patients' rights movements of the 1960s and 70s, and they both believed that history was a tool that could be used to understand health disparities and the inadequacy of existing medical systems. The goal of their work was to address health injustices and to fix them. This was medical history as a tool for political and social activism. The stories that Reverby and Rosner told were often critical of both doctors and the medical profession, and because of this, their 1978 paper provoked a bitter controversy within the field. So in our discussion today, we want to talk a little bit about how the field changed in the aftermath of that essay's publication. So we're going to bring the story up to the present, more or less. So as we said, uh, particularly offended by Reverby and Rosner's arguments were physician historians, who believed that this new approach was simply as one 1980 article put it, medical history without medicine. Here we have the title from that article. Uh, this review article attacked those who followed in Reverby and Rosner's footsteps, arguing that their style uh, 
uh, did not demonstrate proper respect for doctors, that it neglected the laboratory, the clinic, and doctors' ideas, and that it basically served to stoke hatred of the medical profession. So what ensued over the course of the 1980s was a battle, a battle between the MDs and the PhDs. Historians like Reverby and Rosner, um, who received their training in academic uh, graduate programs in history, wanted social histories of medicine, that is, uh, histories of medicine that related to race, class, gender, and politics. What the MDs wanted was more or less the status quo, that is, the great doctor's way of doing things. By the end of the 1990s, the outcome of the battle between MDs and PhDs was clear. Uh, the PhDs won. One way we can see this is by looking at article titles um, from, from articles published in the Bulletin of the History of Medicine, which is one of the premier journals in the field. In the early 1980s, 50% uh, of all of these articles focused on physicians. However, by the end of the 1990s, this figure dropped to about 30%. And, whereas only about 3% of all articles in the early 1980s focused on things like gender, race, sexuality, and patients themselves, by the end of the 1990s, this figure had risen to between 10 and 15%. In addition to Rever B. and Rosner's essay, there have been a few other key works that have really done quite a lot to bring into existence what we now call the social history of medicine. I wanted to briefly touch on some of these works just to give you a deeper appreciation for what this new way of doing things really looks like. And the first text I wanted to talk about is a 1962 book called The Cholera Years. It was written by Charles Rosenberg, an American historian, and the book looks at responses to three cholera epidemics in 19th century New York City. One of Rosenberg's big points with this book was that uh, the idea that diseases play a major role in history. They impact our material existence and our institutions in rather profound ways. But beyond this, Rosenberg argues that by studying past epidemics, we open a window onto society and politics, and we get to see how these things function and how they're interrelated with medicine. Um, as he shows in the book, 19th century debates about what caused cholera and about how it could be treated or prevented drew upon ideas that were both cultural and scientific. It was often moral concerns that drove the city's response to this disease. So Rosenberg's book showed that medical knowledge is something that really cannot be considered apart from politics and society. A second really key book was Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor. This was published in 1978. Uh, it's a book about how cultural values influence the meanings we assign to disease. In particular, Sontag talks about tuberculosis and cancer and about patients' experiences of these diseases in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Just like Rosenberg, she argues that social and cultural dynamics contribute to the way we define disease, uh, which she examines by paying attention to language, uh, the kinds of metaphors that the news media, for example, uses when talking about illness. The general takeaway of the book is that medicine does not exist outside culture, and that uh, the way that we think about disease is shaped not just by biology, but by our own values, and frequently, our sense of morality. A third key text uh, was Thomas McKean's 1978 book, The Role of Medicine, um, published the same year as Sontag's Illness as Metaphor. Uh, this book used the tools of historical epidemiology to look at changing mortality rates over time. His big question was, does medicine work? Uh, what exactly determines patterns of health and disease. Focusing on England in the 1800s, he concluded, interestingly, that medicine was not the key factor in the declining mortality rates of that century. 
What really mattered, McKean argued, was wage growth, better working conditions, and general increases in financial health. For him, the implications of this were clear. Western nations had spent too much money on advanced technological systems of medical care that offered limited returns at great cost. His research forced historians to ask about how medicine works at various moments in time and to consider how effective that medicine is in improving people's lives. So, where are we today? As we've seen, the history of medicine today is a very different field than it started out as. What used to be a field dominated by retired medical doctors is now one dominated by people like me, professional historians, people who come to medicine not from a clinical background, but from an academic one tied to the humanities and social sciences. A second key change concerns the subjects of medical history. What was once a field filled with stories about the heroic deeds of doctors past is now one filled with stories about good and bad doctors, but also about patients, about medical systems and institutions, and about the relationship between medical developments and more general political, economic, and sociocultural ones. And that's not all. If there's been a shift in terms of who's doing medical history and what they're writing about, there's also been a shift in terms of the goals of their writing. No longer simply about making doctors more humane, medical history today is about often uh, about remedying injustices within healthcare and making society on the whole more equitable. Instead of recounting stories about straightforward linear progress over time, these new histories are often critical of the idea of progress and they criticize the idea frequently that medicine is an unambivalent good for society. So where do we go from here? In what follows, I'd like to briefly lay out the major themes we'll be pursuing as we learn more about the history of medicine. Uh, and there are five of these in total. The first is disease. Of course, diseases have a history. Many of the diseases that were most prevalent in society in the, in the past are different from those that plague us today. So what has caused shifts in the human disease profile from one age to the next? This is certainly something worthy of consideration. And so too is it important to talk about the nature and the meaning of disease. What makes something a disease exactly? Who decides? Uh, how do forces both biological and cultural shape our ideas about what's normal and about what's pathological? Our second theme, healers. Here we approach medical practitioners not via the great doctor's framework, but instead as people. People who, like everybody else, need to make a living uh, and often struggle for respect and patronage. So how do healers go about practicing medicine? How do they attempt to build clientels? How do they try to enhance their reputations? Our third theme is patients. Here, we're interested not just in patients' interactions with doctors, but their social lives more generally. What are their illness experiences like? What kinds of therapeutic behaviors do they engage in? Fourth, medical knowledge. Here we're interested in how people make claims to know certain things about the human body, about disease, about the natural world. How is this knowledge produced? If it's contested, how are debates resolved? What does the construction of medical knowledge tell us about how religion, politics, and cultural concerns shape medicine? Fifth, and finally, medicine and society. This is where we ask some big questions about the impact that diseases and medicine have on human history. How do they impact the course of battles or shape the outcomes of wars, for example? Uh, what role have new vaccines or drugs played in the changing quality of work and life for humans across time and space? So hopefully this week's lectures have given you a good sense of how the history of medicine as a field of academic study has developed over the last couple centuries. We're going to regularly return to some of these historiographical matters over the course of the semester, so consider this a foundation to build off of. With the basics covered, we are now ready to plunge into our first historical unit of the semester, Medicine in the Ancient World. For that, I'll see you all next week.